Next on the Broadway show, prepare to be swept away. We're sitting down with the cast and creative team from the new musical inspired by the songs of the Avid Brothers. Plus, it's good to be king. I'm catching up with the new star of The Lion King, Vincent Jamal Hooper. And we're taking a walk with one of the stars of Kimberly Akimbo. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. Prepare to be swept away by a new musical that's testing its sea legs right now in the nation's capital. Thanks so much for joining us, and Happy New Year. I'm Tamsin Fidel. The new musical, Swept Away, is inspired by the songs of the Avid Brothers, and it's on stage right now at Arena Stage in Washington, D.C. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. That's right, Tamsin. This compelling new musical about a real-life shipwreck is playing right here at Arena Stage. I sat down with the cast and creative team to find out more. I realized 20 years, actually, the anniversary is coming up of, of this album that inspired this musical. Can you remember sort of like what about this story resonated? I mean, absolutely. Seth and I come from a, a, <laughs> a long line of adventure stories, at sea, disaster stories. Our father, he passed down a love for, yeah. for this type of nonfiction. He, yeah, he, he imprinted a, a bit of horror and a bit of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, like, uh, I think for him, it comes from a place of interest in heroism and, uh -huh. and survival. But uh, there was a book called The Custom of the, of the Sea. And it was the story. And for us, we were driving around to places that were uh, seemed unknown uh, in a van. We seemed to have nothing but this belief that we were doing something that was true, like you know, like young people, young people do. But we were in that, living it, and it was easy to see that 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 van as our vessel. We took ourselves quite seriously. Like we, we were in our little lifeboat, separated, you know, like we, we were seeing our, our peers succeed and we were seeing ourselves sort of extricating ourselves from uh, the common template, you know, and, and the, the, the common sort of tunnel of experience. And it was scary and, and we, we felt very driven to survive. Well, you send my life Darling, when you're on the floor. I feel like you may be like secreted, if that's still a term, this show, because you're a super fan of the Avett Brothers. You said backstage at American Idiot, you literally had their posters. You were attracted to their music, and did you, but did you ever imagine that you would now be in a position like this? I mean, no. did you see a, a theater piece out of it? or Never. Did... They write this really potent high stakes music. Like I knew that thematically it was super duper rich, but I had never thought, oh, somebody really needs to make a musical out of those songs. It, it, it just hadn't quite crossed my mind. It's very surreal because I just have so much respect and admiration for them as artists. And it's, uh, I don't take it for granted. You know, when I walk out on stage every night, it's, it's a privilege to get to live inside their songs for a night and to, to, to sing these songs and to, expand on the themes that they've put into their lyrics. It's it's something I absolutely treasure. Forever I will move like the world that turns beneath me and when I lose my direction I'll look up to the sky when the black dress strikes upon the ground I'll be ready to surrender and remember we're all in it is four guys who are stuck in a boat together. Right. That's a very tense setup, yeah. very theatrical setup. Was that immediately exciting to you? Is that sort of the tension of that? It was intriguing and daunting mm. because look, you know, like Alfred Hitchcock's Lifeboat is sure. one of my favorites. And, but a lot of people fall to that movie because it is so theatrical, mm -hmm. because the conceit of being trapped on a boat, how do you do that? And figuring that out, I knew was gonna be a challenge. And one that I ended up really taking on and having a great time with uh, the design team to figure out how to do it. So what was your reaction when you first got your hands on this script and, and these roles? <laughs> I mean, this is a very unusual story for, for yeah. a musical. When I first read the script, my jaw was on the floor by the end when I was like, it went there. 
Holy crow. You like, yeah, yeah. I can't. I'm, it was it's not what you're anything. expecting. I'm not. All I'm right, not. Good. I'm just saying you gotta it watch takes some each other. It, it, it takes big swings. Yeah. Oh, it, it goes, does. It goes yeah. in unexpected and it covers directions. so much. It's forgiveness and redemption and choices we make. And, you know, it's just a, it's just beautiful. It's, and it's all done without intermission in 90 minutes. Yeah. You know, and it's amazing. So we're in 1888. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. What is it like playing guys of that time and finding these characters? In 1888, it's just this and, and burly and and you get to just grow the beards out and and it's it's very gruff and and it's a hard existence because we did a lot of research on the whaling world and these guys were out at sea at six months at a time and their wives and kids they just left them but you know i you wonder why they did it outside of just the adventure and maybe a place to be structured it was like the wild west on a little boat uh, what do you think of musicals? I know nothing about that world, but the idea of having the songs released from us and given to the world in that way, you know, it's, it's extremely exciting. It feels like, you know, as we move through our lives and, you know, eventually pass on ourselves, the songs perhaps can just can keep living in different forms in different places. How did this show come your way, and what was exciting about it for you? Well, it was it was the strangest genesis you could imagine, which is in 2017, uh, I got an email out of the blue from a producer named Matthew Maston, who I'd never met before, young producer, and it said essentially, do you know the Avid Brothers album Mignonette and do you think it could be a musical? That very day, I went out and I listened to the album while I was hiking. And the very next day, I did that thing that your agent says never to do, which is I emailed back and I said, I'm in. But uh, I have one caveat, which is the Avids have to be willing to open up their entire song catalog. And uh, thankfully they were. So I reached out to them and I said, I said, I'd like to tell you what I'm doing. So I flew to North Carolina. I sat at Scott Avid's breakfast table with Scott and Seth for the for first time I'd ever met them and said, okay, let me tell you the story. And I kind of told the whole, I acted it out. I said, this is where we do this song. This is where this happens. And they could not have been more generous. And then I said, but there's one point in the song where I need a hymn. And they wrote a song called Lord Lay Your Hand, which is a hymn and then is reprised. And it's, it's Stark Sands' sort of first big solo number, and it's absolutely breathtaking. If you're looking for truth, I'm proof, you'll find it there. Lord, lay your hand there. If you're looking for truth, I'm proof, you'll find it there. Guide me. If you're looking for truth, I'm proof, you'll find it there. And they'd be nothing but willing to change lyrics, to explore different ways of, of approaching the songs, different music, different instruments. So if you're an Avid Brothers fan, you're gonna hear those songs you love in different ways. Musical theater only exists because it does a certain thing that nothing else does. You know, it's like any art form. It's why the Elizabethan sonnet exists or why jazz exists or why, you know, bluegrass exists or abstract expressionism or anything. Like, it, it only exists because it had to, because the, no, no other thing would express it like it does, you know? So seeing these, these guys do this, it, it's, it's this once in a lifetime, once in many lifetimes possibly, uh, opportunity to see this music that you wrote and that you presented possibly thousands of times tur turned into an expression that you never thought possible, you know? And these four guys and the entire cast are, are, are um, remarkably equipped to do that. Make sure my sister knows I loved her Make sure my mother knows the same Always remember there was nothing worth sharing Like the love that let us share our name I'm really excited to be a part of something that is so unique that it's got this really avid fan base for the music. The Avid Brothers fan base is really, really strong and fervent and just under the radar of like mainstream sort of pop music. And then you have 
the fan base of musical theater who are going to come see the musicals that they, they hear are cool. So those musical theater fans are going to be introduced to this Avid Brothers music, and those Avid Brothers fans are going to be introduced to the form of musical theater, and that intersection is really interesting and exciting to me. Yeah. And you can feel it in the room as well. Vincent Jamal Hooper roars as Broadway's new Simba in the long-running hit The Lion King. We caught up at the Star Child rooftop at the Civilian. What is this role like for you? I mean, this is a role that everybody knows and is aware of, from yeah. the youngest of Broadway fans to the oldest. Um, what has this been like for you? It's been really wonderful. I mean, it's a, it's a subtly spiritual show, so there's a lot of ways that I feel like I found myself connecting to it uh, that feel very profound and sort of um, full circle in a way. It was the first show I ever saw, uh, like right when I first got into theater. My mom took me to the national tour that came through Texas, and here we are, you know, years later, and I'm playing the role on Broadway. That's amazing. How <laughs> yeah. old were you when you first saw the uh, show? I believe I was like 16 or 17. So w did you fall in love with Broadway then, or was it, was it way before that? That was sort of my first, yeah, like the first time I sort of was like, oh wait, this is like a career that people do. Um, and, and then sort of found my way into like regional shows in Texas, and then, um, yeah, people just word of mouth kind of got me, uh, kept working. Is there anybody that you've seen in this role that you say like that's, you know, somebody that's helped help me craft, uh, you know, who I want to be in that part? I mean, I've only seen the show the one time that many years ago, so I'm like, I, I don't think so, uh, which is really exciting as well because I think that uh, I'm able to bring something new oh, to so it. Oh, so you never saw it on Broadway then? No, 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 only oh, the wow. tour. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Did you do that on purpose now? I'm no. not seeing it? Okay. <laughs> I mean, right. I, I saw it on Broadway only recently because, yeah. you know, I'm doing it. But um, I feel excited about the opportunity to bring something new to it, and also the creative team uh, has given me uh, room to sort of explore and discover some things that uh, maybe, yeah, uh, are, are unexpected. Uh, what's your experience been like and your time been like uh, in New York now as you're doing this? And walking walking through the theater district, walking through Times Square, walking through the door of, of, of that historic theater to do this show. Yeah, uh, it's, been, it's been so wonderful to feel like, you know, after being on the road for so many years, uh, getting the opportunity to set some roots down and, and you know, reconnect to friends who are here and see them in their shows uh, while I have the time. Yeah. And um, yeah, it feels nice to feel like I'm sort of more part of the community now uh, and getting to just kind of be in the mix of it all. Um, yeah, it's such an honor. It's time to take a walk with one of the stars of Kimberly Akimbo. Here's Charlie Cooper. Allie, we're headed to work with you today. Yes, we're going to the booth, Kimberly Akimbo the Musical. Yes, this is actually your fifth Broadway show. What does oh it my feel God. like? Well, it is still very exciting. I'm still very grateful. And this in particular, I think, is a really good one. And the critics did agree. What does your pre-show prep look like? Because I saw on Twitter that sometimes you're riding the train, yeah. empty trains, and just like belting out a ballad. <laughs> Like, I get on, I'm at the last stop in Astoria. Mm -hmm. So, oftentimes when I'm coming into work, people are coming home from work. Uh. And so, there's, I often get an empty train. And it's like a gift as a singer because I can just warm up on the train. And, and uh, to be fair, like, there has been a time or two where there has been somebody on the train. And it's New York City, so it's like, who cares? People don't care. There so are you just weirder, give them a show. Yes, there are weirder things. I'll be, I'll be like, whoa! And it's just like, okay, there's somebody singing. I've seen worse things. Nina? Look at that, Nina. She's in the show too. I love when that happens. <laughs> do you still have nerves? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Really? Oh, gosh, yeah. What do you do to get rid of them? You know what? I would say, like, I probably have more nerves now than I did when I first started out. Because, like, no. when, when you're like 20 and you haven't lived your life yet, you're like, there's like no fear, right? Fair enough. Yep. Yep. I hadn't had any, like, I hadn't gotten knocked down enough yet. Yeah. I've been now, see, now when you get knocked down a peg every once in a while, like there's like a gratitude about it. Right. You know, right. like I don't take what I do for granted. I love what I do. Um, and yeah, and so maybe like I still get nerves. And um, uh, I think they say like when you get nerves, though, that just means like you care. Yeah. You know, and totally. I care about what I do. I want to do a great job. Um, don't want to mess it up. Well, listen, we're at work, lady. We made it. We made it to I the know. booth theater. I think it's time to go. But okay. thank you so much for letting us walk with you to work. Well, thanks for um, keeping me company. Of course. OK. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> this is a Broadway show, and we're back in just a few.
It takes a whole lot of people to keep a Broadway show running, that's for sure. From the actors on stage to the orchestra and the people behind the scenes, whose names you don't see in the playbill, the wardrobe department, the ushers, and sometimes even a physical therapist. Let's send it out to Perry Sook. Athletic feats can be very strenuous on the body, especially when you do them eight times a week like they do here on Broadway. Add that to the moves of MJ and MJ the musical, and you might need a physical therapist. Luckily, they've got one here at the Neil Simon. Let's head inside to meet the girl who keeps him dancing. So right here on this table is, is where you do it all, yeah? This is where we do it all in this tiny little room. That's crazy. So how many, you know, it's a pretty big cast in MJ. How many of the people are you working on on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so I'm here about nine hours a week. So it kind of depends on the day, whether I'm here for two and a half hours, an hour and a half. But yeah, so we have 20 minute slots. They're usually all full. I can imagine. I mean, the physicality of the show, not only is it so dance heavy, it's so specific. I mean, when you think MJ, you think the leaning, you think all the moves, that isolation, that's gotta be tough on the muscles. Are there any specific ones that you see yourself working on more than others? Yeah, so, you know, I've worked on a lot of shows now and there's some shows where it'll be one injury is really prevalent for the whole show, so shoulders or ankles. Um, but MJ, I think because it is such a whole body movement, mm -hmm. um, I kind of see a little bit of everything. <laughs> so necks, shoulders, backs, uh, legs, everything. So it's kind of nice that way we get yeah. a, a good amount of variety. When you were studying to be a physical therapist, were you like, yeah, I'm gonna be on Broadway. You know, how did, how did that happen? Yeah, so I kind of, um, I thought I wanted to go to med school and I majored in dance in college and broke my foot dancing and I went to a great dance medicine PT. And from that moment on, I was like, this is it. I am gonna work with dancers and I'm gonna be a physical therapist. So that's kind of how it happened. And I was really fortunate to get this job and I've, I've been really lucky to be able to work on a lot of Broadway shows and it's been a really great experience. Does that background benefit you as you're working through these? Absolutely, um, especially having injured myself dancing. I feel like I can um, you know, relate to these people. I totally understand what they're going through and um, the demands that it takes to be able to do this show a million times. And I think that that's really an amazing thing. Like in my office, every PT has been in the performing arts in some capacity. So we really can relate to our patients, um, which I think is important um, in this field in particular. And Juliet just recently celebrated its one year anniversary on Broadway. The pop concert Spectacular, nominated for Best Musical and Best Costume Design at this year's Tony Awards. Here's Beth Stevens with another edition of Building Broadway. Thanks, Tamsin. Tony winning costume designer Paloma Young offers an array of Shakespeare and chic for Anne Juliet. I talked to her about the inspiration behind the pop musical. So this show takes Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet and just does this amazing blend with pop culture and you know musical icons. So tell me what you did in terms of research to mix these two elements. Well, because of the choreography, because of the language, and because of the music, we knew we were not going to be doing just straight period clothes. You can't move in them. They don't follow the the feeling of the show. We did want it to feel like anyone who has ever had any experience with a Shakespeare show would get something that they expected, but in an unexpected way. So we've got some corsets, we've got some doublets, we've got some pumpkin hose, we've got uh, one cod piece, we've got some ruffs, but then- right, That's like the collar, right? Yeah, the Elizabethan. That's the, yeah, the Elizabethan ruff. Um, we have a whisk, which is even more of the sort of Elizabethan style. But then each of those pieces gets mixed with contemporary streetwear, streetwear that feels very 90s and 2000s. The Max Martin era is also quite large. Right, because this is all the music of Max Martin, so you have these pop icons that you're getting to work with and play with. Right, it was a combination of building our capital C costume pieces from scratch and doing that within our sort of candy color palette and then making them seem very old because it wants to look quite broken in has been a really fun challenge to figure out how to make things that are hearty enough to be danced in full out eight times a week and so there are a lot of tweaks 
we want these costumes to look like they're being maintained by a scrappy troupe of actors. The concept of our design only improves the more that these costumes get repaired, break down and repaired. The Broadway show is going to be back in just a second. The search for the Holy Grail is going strong on Broadway, and in honor of the revival of Spamalot, we've got a new vlog over at Broadway.com. It's called The Weekly Grail, hosted by Leslie Rodriguez Kritzer. She plays the Lady of the Lake. The latest episode is now live over at Broadway.com. That's going to do it for us, but for tickets or if you want to check out extended cuts of all these interviews, you can head on over to Broadway.com. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.